for my good friend Alex McDonald. What's up, Stimo Night? How we doing? We good? Good. Hey, just to clear the air on that, Luke was actually the one who completed the gallon challenge. You guys know he's a tank as well. Thank you. But yeah, he, he won that. So give it up for Luke really quick. Yeah. Yes. Give credit where credit is due. Hey, isn't it horrible when you guys try to fix a problem in your life and you make it worse in the process? Isn't it just terrible? You, you like have a problem, you try to fix it, and you end up just making it a lot worse in the process? I think the worst example of this for me actually happened when I was in college, my, summer after my sophomore year. I was actually at Kaleo, uh, summer thing that Stumo does. I, I was a D group leader that summer, and I had a problem, and the way I tried to fix it just made it a lot worse. So my D group showed up this summer. There's a couple guys I didn't really know that well. I wanted to make an amazing first impression. And so I was like, man, let's, let's get in the car, let's go to the beach. Another guy in my group, also named Alex, he offered to drive his 2006 rear wheel drive Mustang. It was awesome. We all, we all piled in, four dudes in this little car, and, and we drive to the beach. And if you've ever been to the beach on a weekend, you know that parking can be kind of a bummer sometimes. Like you're looking for a spot, everyone else is there. So we're, we're circling like a shark, we're circling the beach, looking for a spot. And all of a sudden, this golden spot just appears on the horizon. It's between two big trucks. It's, it's a nice piece of pavement. It's a, it's a five yard walk to the entrance of the beach. I was like, Alex, this is our spot, man. Like, let's park here. He's like, man, you think I can park there? I see some sand. And I'm like, no, dude, this is good. This is the spot. Let's park. And, and so he whips his car into the spot and, and we pull up and they kind of hear this like thud and like a and his Mustang sinks into a big hole in the sidewalk, into the sand. And we are stuck. Friends, this is my first impression, mind you. I know these guys very well. I had a problem. And so I'm like, okay, what do we do? What do we do? Well, hey, let's just go to the beach. You know, we're here. Let's have fun. Let's not let's put a damper on things. Maybe the problem will kind of go away. So we go to the beach. We have a good time. We come back to the car. Sure enough, it's still stuck in the sand. We have a problem. I'm like, man, we got to fix this. So what do I do? Like, okay, come up, come up with an idea. Everyone's looking to me on the T group leader. I'm like, man, I gotta come save the day, I guess. Let's see what we can do. So I have Alex get in the front seat. I'm like, okay, what I want you to do is on three, just go ahead and gun it, and the rest of us will push from behind. So we all get in position, we're like squatted down, we're like ready to push this thing. And Alex gun takes the gas, he guns it, and the real world spins and it digs deeper into the sand. Okay, plan number one did not work. The problem just got worse. Okay, back to the drawing board. What do we do? Man, why don't you throw it into reverse and we'll push from the other direction? Totally different plan. <laughs> Put it in reverse, <laughs> push in the other direction. So we get in position again, we, we push, he spins the wheels deeper into the sand. Like, man, this car is going to be underground by the time we are done trying to figure this out. So we're walking around, Alex is really frustrated with me. He's not really talking to me anymore. I'm like, this is going great. <laughs> and as if sent by God, this truck drives up. Massive truck, amazing truck, like the trucks I've seen out here in the parking lot. Massive truck. And this guy rolls out his window and says, Hey, I see you guys are stuck. I have some tow cables in the back. Do you want me to pull you out? I'm like, Hallelujah! This guy is from God. This is awesome. I'm going to save the day as a DG leader. See, I knew exactly what to do. And, and so he's like, Okay, go ahead and hook up the tow cables. Alex looks at me. I don't know why he's trusting me at this point. He says, Man, I don't know what to do. Could you hook it up for me? Okay, I reach up under the front of his Mustang, I find something that feels pretty solid, hook the tow cables up underneath, I'm like, all right, let's pull this puppy out, fix the problem. So the guy gets in his truck, pulls it, and what do you know? The car comes out. I'm like, yes, I've saved the day, redemption. We walk around to the front of Alex's vehicle and the front bumper has been removed. There's like liquid shooting out. <laughs> I'm like, I don't even know what that is. We found out it was the power steering fluid later. So he couldn't turn his car. And that friends is how I took a bad situation and made it worse. How I ruined my friend's car on the first day of Kaleo. Man, isn't that just horrible? When you try to fix a problem and you make it worse in the process. I think about, man, you have a, you have a friend who's kind of down, feeling sad, you say something to try to console them, and you end up just making it worse. Man, I wish I didn't say anything. And some of you guys can relate to this. Back in fifth grade, you get done with you know, football practice, you got some BO going on, get some ax, spray it all over the place. <laughs> 
Man, what'd you do? You just made that situation worse. Now you smell worse, and someone could light you on fire. What is going on? You take a horrible situation and try to make it worse in the process. And you know, those are some you know, funny examples, but when it comes to our personal lives, our, our emotional health, even our spiritual lives, I think oftentimes we can do the same thing. We find a problem, try to fix it, and make it worse in the process. You know, think about when it comes to things such as you know, depression, anxiety, purposelessness, loneliness, isolation, feelings of being overwhelmed. Can you guys relate to those at all? Man, when those things show up in our lives, sometimes we can try to fix the problem and make it worse. I think about uh, college. In our culture, college is supposed to be the best four years of your life. Yet, when we look at the stats, those are some of the highest rates of depression, anxiety, loneliness, and stress. And I wonder, I wonder why. Man, our world's fixes for those things maybe aren't fixing it. Maybe they're making the problem worse. Man, you're feeling lonely. What do you need to do? Man, you need to go out to a party. You need to, to live it up a bit. Maybe go hook up with somebody. Uh, you're feeling stressed out. What do you need to do? Maybe some drugs, alcohol, take the edge off. Uh, you know, maybe you need to buy some new things or go to try out a new experience. Uh, maybe you just need to be more active and see what other people are doing on social uh, media. It's actually amazing the stats on, on social media usage uh, in young adults. Man, using Instagram is one of the uh, linked with depression. It's one of the highest uh, rates of depression are people who end up using Instagram a lot. It's pretty amazing uh, to look at what our culture says is the answer to these problems, what the fixes are, but sometimes they just make the problem worse. And it's not just college, it's, it's after college too. Man, maybe these problems will be fixed with the next new big house or, or the next job promotion, the next car I can buy. Isn't it horrible when you try to fix a problem and make it worse in the process? Man, what's also about God, the God of the Bible, God that I worship, is that he knows this is the case. He knows that as humanity, we have a problem, and we maybe don't always know how to fix it. But the reason God is so good is God has the remedy, and he wants all of us to be able to experience that. So today we're going to be looking at Matthew chapter 9. Uh, starting in verse 35. If you have a Bible or on your phone, you can look at it. I'm also going to throw all the scriptures up if you just want to read behind me. Uh, but we're going to take a look at Jesus' life and see what he has to say about this very topic. So we'll pick it up in Matthew uh, chapter 9, verse 35. It says this, And Jesus went throughout all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom and healing every disease and every affliction. So what we have here is basically a summary of what Jesus has kind of been up to uh, in the, the previous chapters. Jesus has had this awesome public ministry. He's become this, this sort of public figure. Uh, he's been going around teaching. He's been saying things about what people should be doing in life. He's been telling people about what God's kingdom is like. Uh, it's awesome. It says in the Bible that people said he, he taught like one with authority, that the very words that Jesus said made people think, man, there has to be something different about this guy. What he says is just so true. It's really cool. And not only was he, was he teaching, but he's also going around and healing diseases. He was helping people out. Uh, you know, Jesus would see someone maybe physically injured or sick, and, and he would heal them with, by just speaking or, or touching. It, it was miraculous. And Jesus did these things uh, because he loved people, but also to prove he was who he said he was. Man, Jesus was going around claiming to be the son of God. Pretty amazing. And this is where we pick it up in, in Matthew chapter 9, verse 35. Jesus has just gone on sort of a tour of doing a lot of good, and his disciples were with him. Verse 36. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion for them, because they were harassed and helpless, like sheep without a shepherd. So this verse gives us a little bit of insight as to how Jesus felt as he was going around doing this ministry, as he was speaking to people and healing people. He said he was compassionate. Why? Because they're harassed and helpless. Now, when I think of the words harassed and helpless, I think harassed equals, and they had a problem, and helpless means they didn't know how to fix it. And isn't it horrible when you have a problem 
and don't know how to fix it. When Jesus saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because just like you and I have experienced this day, some of these, these things that get us down in life, Jesus saw that back then as he was going around helping people. Uh, not much different than what we talked about seeing today. You know, People were physically hurt. They were trying to fill the, these voids of purposelessness, loneliness, uh, anxiousness, depression. Uh, they're trying to fill those voids with, with reputation, money, the same things you and I try to to this day. And when Jesus saw them, he said, man, they're harassed and helpless. they got a problem. They don't know how to fix it. You know, Jesus also goes further to, to compare them to, a, to sheep without a shepherd, which I think is a super interesting analogy. Sheep without a shepherd. What are sheep without a shepherd like? Man, I did some research actually a couple weeks ago on what domesticated sheep who rely on a shepherd are actually like. And friends, I don't know if you know this, these are some of the most like helpless, like sad animals I've ever heard of. Sheep without a shepherd. It's, it's kind of ridiculous actually how helpless a sheep is without a shepherd. I mean, first of all, Sheep are horrible predators. Like, they're horrible at fighting predators. Like, you've never seen a sheep and been like, dude, that sheep is going to mess you up. Like, no, that sheep is in a petting zoo and he looks very safe to touch. <laughs> like, sheep are not a threat. Uh, they're also fairly helpless on their own. There's this whole idea uh, of sheep called a cast sheep. And a cast sheep is this. It's a sheep that has fallen on its back and can't get up. <laughs> So she just falls on its back and kicking it up. It'd be a result of it's, it's like getting too like puffed up, like it's fur or fuzz, or whatever you call that wool, uh, getting too big. But also, like if a sheep manages to get all the way on its back, its little like puny legs are so worthless that it like it just can't like turn over on its own. It can't do anything. And much of a sheep's anatomy is dependent on gravity. So if it gets on its back, it like can't digest correctly because it literally needs like gravity to help it out. Like it's like it's like the saddest stuff I've ever heard. But like, like if they harass and help us, I think dude, a sheep is that. If it doesn't have a shepherd to come flip it back over, it doesn't have a shepherd to come show it where the food's at. It's amazing. And Jesus is saying, as I look at humanity's attempts to fix these problems in their heart and soul, that's kind of what it reminds me of. And, you know, we laugh about it because it is pretty funny, honestly. I don't think Jesus was laughing about it. When he saw humanity, he said, man, the best way I can think to describe a life without me is like a sheep without a shepherd. Searching for the cheap substitutes to fix the problem and making the problem worse in the process. It's amazing. Doesn't it stink to have a problem and not know how to fix it? Remember, God is good, and he has the remedy. You know, as Jesus looks at humanity, he doesn't think, man, dumb sheep. No, he thinks he has compassion. That's what the verse says. We saw the crowds, he had compassion. Uh, it's an amazing word, this word for compassion. If you were to look at the original Greek that the Bible was written in, it's the word splachnizomai. Say that with me. Splachnizomai. splachnizomai. One more time, let me hear you guys say it. Splachnizomai. It's kind of fun to say. Actually, in English, we don't have a word that is comparable to that. It's, in fact, the word splachnizomai doesn't just mean compassion. It means to be moved so deeply that, like, you have a physical response, like, in your stomach and in your body. Splachnizomai. And so when Jesus saw humanity's plight, he wasn't like, man, dumb sheep, they should figure this out. He was like, no, I have compassion because what I know they need is me. Man, Jesus understands. He has compassion. He hates the consequences of sin with us. He knows that there are struggling people, and he looks out to the crowds that need him, and he knows that a relationship with him is the remedy. That's why Jesus came, that we could have a relationship, that he would ultimately go to the cross, that he would die for our sins to offer us forgiveness, that by trusting in him, we might be connected to God the Father. That's why Jesus said, hey, they're like sheep without a shepherd. Well, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for his sheep. So what we see is, is people are hurt, don't know how to fix it. God has the remedy through Jesus, a relationship with him. And as Jesus looks at the crowds, I think part of the reason he sees compassion is like, man, how are all these people going to know? How are all these people that need me going to know? Well, let's go ahead and check out the next verse because Jesus, he shares the solution. Matthew chapter 9, verses 37 through 38. 
Then he, he being Jesus, said to his disciples, The harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. So Jesus said, hey, here's the solution. As I look out on the crowds, the, the harassed and helpless, the sheep without a shepherd. Hey, another word picture that comes to mind is like a plentiful harvest. And he says, what do we need? We need laborers. We need laborers. What is a laborer? Let's unpack this word picture for a second. It just says the harvest is plentiful. I want you guys to imagine with me a harvest, just fields and fields of wheat, like as far as you can see, like horizon and just wheat. That's as, as fast as you can see. Imagine you're standing there with a farmer, and he's like, man, I cannot wait to reap this harvest. You know, this stuff's ready to pick. It's ready to go. And the more I pick, the more money I'm about to make. Like, it's about to be payday. Like, I'm excited about picking this wheat. This is awesome. There's so much out here. And he's like, okay, I'm just going to get my, my workers to come help me pick all this stuff. And, and he turns around. He's like, hey, where are my workers at? And he's got two guys in a wheelbarrow. Acres and acres of wheat, two guys in a wheelbarrow. Man, how do you think that farmer feels? And there's so much potential out there. All we got to do is go pick it. But where are my laborers? Where are my workers? Where are the guys that help me out? A couple dudes in a wheelbarrow, that would take way too long. We wouldn't get to all of it. Man, God feels the same way about people who need him and don't have anyone in their life to tell him, tell them about him. He looks out at the crowds who are harassed and helpless, who have a problem, don't know how to fix it. And he says, where are my laborers? Where are my workers? The harvest is plentiful. We just have to go and get it. Man, a laborer, is, it's nothing crazy. It's just someone who's willing to break the status quo of life and say, have you heard about my God? Have you heard about what Jesus has done? Who's willing to start that conversation, to share Jesus' thoughts. It's not easy, just like laboring is work. But it's not complicated. It's so needed, so necessary that Jesus makes this prayer request to his disciples. Harvest is plentiful, labor is few. Pray earnestly, the Lord of the harvest, send out laborers. You know, if you think about it, you're probably in this room because God used a laborer to impact you. Probably in the stream because God used a laborer to impact you. This is his method. He says, look, the world's broke. We don't know how to fix it. Man, they need me. Here's the solution. I need laborers to tell people about me. You're probably in this room because a laborer reached out to you. Uh, man, I stand before you today because a laborer reached out to me. Anyone know Taylor Coy in this room? Hey, oh. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, back at University of Tulsa, that, that prestigious university. <laughs> um, yeah. Man, I was a pike, and so was Taylor. Uh, in fact, Taylor's a couple years older than me. He's a junior. I was a freshman. I came into college. I would say the best way I could describe my life was harassed and helpless. I came in not knowing what I wanted, who I was, or what I was doing. <coughs> and what's so awesome is God used Taylor to reach out to me. See, Taylor was a laborer. It wasn't anything crazy. He was just willing to reach out. I think I remember, I was a pledge, so I think one time he like hit me up. and was like, hey, dude, can you swipe me in the cafeteria? Which is just like what pledges had to do. I don't know if they do that here, but <laughs> we had to do that. We had to swipe people in all the time. Taylor's like, hey, will you swipe me in? And, and during that launch, Taylor asked me a very simple question that would change the trajectory of my life. He said, hey, man, what do you think about God? Kind of weird. No one's really ever asked me that before. I don't even remember what like BS answer I came up with, honestly. But it was the start of something. I was like, man, i got to think about this. I don't know what I think about God. And, and, and over time, Taylor shared uh, the Bible with me and, and what the Bible said. And honestly, I have placed my trust in Christ and I'm following Jesus today because Taylor is a laborer and God uses that. That he was the answer to Jesus' prayer. That the Lord of the harvest would raise up laborers. Man, imagine, take, take the laborer or laborers out of your life. Where are you at right now? God uses laborers. He says, this world is broken. We don't know how to fix it. Man, I have the remedy. It's laborers willing to share who I am. Awesome. So I really have, you know, two applications for tonight as we think about this truth that the harvest is plentiful, laborers are few, that God wants people to know him and chose people to get the word out. Uh, and the first one is this. Pray for laborers. You know, Jesus doesn't share too many prayer requests in the Bible, uh, which is 
pretty crazy to think about. But this is a big one. Jesus says, hey, pray for laborers. Ask God to raise up people that are willing to be used by him to reach others. Maybe it's, hey, God, raise up some laborers to come into my fraternity house. God, please introduce my family back home to a laborer. They're harassed and helpless. They could, they could use that. Man, that's, that's, that's one point of it. But let's not only seek to pray for laborers. I want to ask you guys to consider what would it look like to be a laborer? What would it look like to be a laborer? So what's, what's so interesting about this passage is Matthew chapter 9 ends at verse 38, the prayer request. Ask the Lord of the harvest to raise up laborers and send them to the harvest field. Period. Turn the page. Chapter 10, verse 1, starts out like this. He said, and he called to him his 12 disciples and gave them authority over unclean spirits to cast them out and to heal every disease and affliction. I put dot, 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 that names all the disciples, and I just didn't want to read that. Verse 5. These 12 Jesus sent out, instructing them. So what happens? Chapter 9, he has a prayer request. It ends. The very next verse, he says, hey, so remember how he prayed for laborers? Okay, let's go be laborers. Let's go out. And, and Jesus, he, he, he preps them. He says, hey, this is what you need to do. This is how to do it. And he sends them out into the harvest field to go after people to bring them to him. And so Jesus not only asked them to pray, but he sent them out as laborers. And so maybe God has you where you are in your life to be a laborer. You know, maybe, a, maybe someone prayed a long time ago, hey, PiCap needs some laborers. I'm going to ask earnestly for the Lord of the Harvest to send out some laborers. Got any PiCaps in here? No. Hey, maybe God has you where you're at for a reason. Could be an answer to a prayer. Pretty crazy to think about. And, and what I think is so important to remember is that the, these disciples that Jesus sent out were pretty ordinary dudes. These weren't like Bible scholars. Uh, in fact, most of them were fishermen. One of them was like a tax collector. Another one was like an anarchist. Did you guys know that? Simon the Zealot, he was kind of like trying to overthrow the government before he was a follower of Jesus, kind of crazy. Like these guys weren't Bible scholars by any means. They were like normal people like you and me. And Jesus said, hey, you know who I am? That means you have something to share. Go be a laborer. Go be a laborer. You know, so even when it comes to uh, being a laborer, one, one practical step is also to find someone who is a laborer and ask them to come with. You know, that was huge for me when I was in college. Uh, Taylor and I in the Pike House. I was like, man, the way you helped me, man, I want to help other people. Can you show me how? And he did. And it was awesome. And, and we saw stuff happen in our fraternity house. We saw lives change. You know, another example I can think of uh, is Kaleo. For me, Kaleo was an excellent opportunity to be developed as someone who was laboring. Man, as I think about summer options, I think there's a ton of options out there to grow in your walk with God. I think there's far fewer options out there to train to be a laborer, someone who God sends out. I think Kaleo is one of those options. Man, to be a laborer, Kaleo is a great opportunity. Man, people are hurt and don't know how to fix it. God has the remedy, and he chose people to spread it. The harvest is plentiful, and the laborers are few. So what we need to do? Pray for laborers, be a laborer. Can you guys imagine, like, if this whole room committed to those two things, pray for laborers, be a laborer, with all the different ways we are connected, all the different states that we're from, all the different circles of friends that we have? Man, God could use this room in a mighty way for his kingdom that people might know him that people might experience life and redemption and that might experience the God of the universe it's pretty amazing let me pray for us we'll be done Lord I thank you so much uh, just for this group tonight uh, you gathered us together uh, to look into your word uh, God, we thank you that you're a good God, that you don't look at us and think we're dumb or stupid, that we shouldn't feel uh, necessarily ashamed, but God, that you have compassion on us, Lord, that you desire us to be close to you, that while we were still sinners, you died for us. God, we just praise you for that. It's so cool. And, and Lord, we also just praise you for the opportunity you give us, not just to be on the sidelines when it comes to what you're doing, God, to be, to be in it. To be in your will for the world, God, that you desire in your infinite wisdom to use us as ambassadors for you. 
but as you desire to use anyone who's following you uh, to make an impact, uh, to change lives. Um, God, we, we pray that we can have a heart like yours, uh, a heart that sees the need in this world um, and also desires for change in the name. Um, God, thank you so much. Lord, we love you and all these things in your name. Amen. Amen. All right, make some noise for Alex. Make the laborers be a laborer. What a great message. Uh, I get to introduce someone else. I'm getting really good at just introducing people. So the next person who's going to come up is a good friend of mine. Some of you guys know him. He's a CSU alum, so one of our own. Um, another prestigious university, much like Tulsa CSU. <laughs> and this guy is special for a couple reasons. He's doing some professional stuff that's really exciting. Um, he graduated recently from CSU, and so he'll tell you more about that. Um, but another thing that's special about him is this man got me on the soccer field. Okay, I was one of those dudes who grew up playing football and baseball, and I was like not a soccer guy. All right, I don't have the footwork. I'm like, I can't do that. This dude got me playing soccer, and I'm telling you right now, I didn't come within like 10 feet of a goal. But I'm going to tell you, I kicked like at the goal 10 times. So this guy got me out there. Give it up for Brad Holo. This dude's a stud. And so uh, Brad's going to talk to us a little bit about his experience. Um, the first question, dude, do you want to just share a little bit about your story? How'd you come to faith? Thanks for the introduction. Yeah. I'm really not that great at soccer, by the way. Um, you play college anyways. soccer. <laughs> Anyways, uh, a little bit about my story. So um, I grew up in a family that um, didn't go to church. I didn't know who God was growing up. Um, my sophomore year of high school, I got introduced to SCA. Um, some of you guys may um, have gone to SCA before. And from then on, I started going to SCA in church. And um, yeah, from sophomore year until like two years ago when I gave my life to Christ, uh, I was kind of like living this double life, right? Going to um, SCA on Tuesdays and church on Sundays and then uh, doing this like crazy life um, all the other days of the week. And uh, so it wasn't until um, my senior year that uh, Luke and t uh shout out to the laborers, um, really just were constant with me and started pouring into me and started mentioning Kaleo and, and, and recruited me to Kaleo and at the time I had an internship right and I was deep into the party scene um, if you guys know me before uh, before that that summer you guys would have defined me as like the party guy leading the charge I was the vice president of PiCap and um, everybody would come to my house to party so like the idea of me going to Kaleo was was pretty far out, but for some reason, t -Koy and Luke just pursued me and, um, and got me to go to Kaleo, right? And so it was at Kaleo that I went with my fists up at God and fists up kind of at everyone else and asked <laughs> tough questions, and I wasn't easy, so Luke had a ton of, of grace and patience with me, but um, about four weeks in, I decided to uh, make that decision to surrender to Christ, and it's honestly like changed my life completely and no internship no um no other experience has changed my life like uh that summer did and and like luke and the and Tikoi did so anyway since kaleo um went back to or after that first summer at kaleo came back um and i was just on fire for god and i was out there laboring as hard as i can in pie cap um i helped start a bible study or continue a bible study and um, pour into guys like Mitch and Steve and Ben and um, really just start to grow my faith and uh, so yeah then I graduated um, last December and I've been in this program with KPMG doing um, internships and um, going to a master's program so yeah that's kind of where I'm at right now. Cool. Yeah. Thanks bro. So uh, another thing so something you guys might not know about Brad is this dude is a laborer so he was impacted by laborers this guy's made a huge impact came to Kaleo and grew a ton as a spiritual leader and so bro I would just love to sh hear you share what has this looked like for you after college walking with God and being a laborer. Mm -hmm. Yeah well I, I wish I had it all figured out but um, what I've learned is uh, really two words come to mind, initiative and intention and being intentional. Uh, Samson and I actually talked about this this morning, but um, and 
since I've graduated, it really took initiative for me to go out and get plugged into a church and find community and, um, and, and develop in relationships and then being intentional. Like in, in the workforce, there's so many invisible walls built up with everyone. Um, and you can't talk about your faith unless, unless you have this relationship with someone, right? You don't want to just go be going around telling everybody like, oh, Jesus loves you, man. Jesus loves you, right? But here you have all these amazing friendships, right? A lot of you are in fraternities and sororities and you've developed like these amazing rela relationships and you have none of these invisible walls, right? Um, but in the workforce, there are these so-called invisible walls that I guess I've coined the term. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, and it really takes being intentional and taking initiative um, and that's something you can learn right now um, I have a lot of friends that have recently graduated that um, kind of enter this slump right after college like talk to a lot of people that just graduate and they're they're like oh it's good like I just graduated and um, I'm working and it's just like really what life is all about right and what I've noticed is the ones who are intentional to make new relationships and take initiative to um, go to church and get plugged in and, and try new things um, really don't enter that slump. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah, thanks. Last thing I want to hear, so talking about initiative and intentionality, making an impact with people, this whole idea of being a, a spiritual leader, a laborer. Um, my question for you is how did coming to Kaleo and getting trained in that Obviously, that's helped you impact other people, but how has that helped you professionally? Like, did Kaleo and being involved with Stumo on campus, how did that help you in your uh, internships and your work at KPMG? Um, well, I would say that the Bible is full of um, advice and principles to make you a better businessman, a better businesswoman, um, and it has for me. Uh, Stumo and Kaleo help, help me teach me how to study the Bible and learn myself. So one example that comes to mind is before, um, so I was always super driven in college. Like I, I always wanted to just make a ton of money, right? And then I came to Christ and my purpose for going into business has totally changed. Um, but I would say since like learning the Bible and reading the Bible, I realized that um, God doesn't want us to be self-centered, right? God wants us to be other-centered. And that's one principle that has really helped me a lot. Um, in business so this past these past two months I've been working like 75 hour weeks which is crazy I don't know if any of you guys have worked that many hours in a week but it's like 8 30 to 10 30 every day of the week except for like uh, Saturdays and Sundays and um, and so the, the, the last thing you want to do at the end of a 75 hour week is be other centered right the, la the first thing I want to do is just go home and like or at work just like shut off not engage with anybody and um, reading the Bible and having this relationship with God has helped me um, be patient with people and love on others. And so, yeah, it's changed my character for sure. Awesome. Yeah. Thanks a lot. Hey, guys, make some noise for Brad. I'm really excited we got to hear from some special people tonight. I would encourage you, if you, uh, you relate with any of that, about uh, really studying the Bible, having questions for that, or being a spiritual leader and a laborer in your sphere of influence, or what does that look like in the professional world, I would challenge you, go up to those guys and ask some questions. Two very good friends of mine. Um, we've, we've talked about Kaleo a lot tonight, so I have some announcements. Um, if you're in the room and you're going to Kaleo, can you make some noise for me? Can you make some noise for me? Let's go. Okay, so Kaleo has been so well received and there's so much excitement that I actually have some news for you guys. Girl spots for CSU are actually full right now. So just know that girl spots are full, but if you are a guy and you're in this room, hey, come to Kaleo, make that jump. I would really challenge you, um, Brad, I, I would challenge you to go ask him this. He had an internship lined up and dialed in and he was really worried about if I go to Kaleo, am I gonna sacrifice professionally? Like, do I have to choose God or like work and income? Can I only have one? And the answer is no. Um, and so it's really helped in a lot of ways from like sharing his faith with his coworkers um, to being someone, I talk to a lot of people who graduate and a lot of their friends who get stressed out by the work week go and blow off steam and do a bunch of self-destructive stuff. Whereas coming to Kaleo and learning to walk with God and find peace and hope through prayer, like that's a great way to come recharge after a 75 hour week. Um, so if you're a guy, consider Kaleo. If you don't know how to apply, come talk to me um, or someone in the room, they'll hook you up. Uh, so that is Kaleo. Also, separately, does anyone know what, what month are we in right now? It's, it's March. There are whispers, guys. I got a whisper. There's whispers of a March Madness bracket. 
So get ready, ladies and gentlemen, to make some money for March Madness. <laughs> and lastly, we are here, same time next week, same time, same place for Stimo. Thank you so much for coming. That's a wrap.